The mission in the imaging space is to inspire creativity, and while doing so, improve the capturing of photography. It's a partially sunny day in Monterey, California. I'm here at the Sony Condo event, and if you haven't guessed it by now, we're going to talk Sony. And <laughs> I've asked Neil and Mike to sit with me and uh, talk about the last five years of where Sony's been and where they've come, and kind of touch base and take a look at uh, the next five years on where things are going. It's pretty exciting times right now. Uh, about five years ago, I attended a Sony event in New York City, and Sony has the best events ever and you know very transparent very open kimono and uh, at that event I had the opportunity to sit down with the CEO at the time and his name was Kaz Hirai. Kaz Hirai and it was an informal sit down it was after his presentation where he showed off a new 42 megapixel pocket camera which was pretty cool it was the RX1 and uh, he sat to me and we, he, he's, we were talking photography and he remembered the smell of stop bath in his father's That's dark room right. and we talked all about the photography and how the passion that he had for photography was driving him to where he wanted to see, see sony go and he just kind of you know tapped me on the shoulder and goes five years number one well here we are five years later it's, where are we it's very impressive you remember that because that was actually <laughs> uh, a factual internal goal uh actually set by the gentleman that reported to him, uh, Ishizuka-san, Shigeki Ishizuka, who is the head of our worldwide global imaging business, professional, consumer, everything in between. And he set that goal in 2013, Neil, right? Yep. That uh, if we're going to get into this business in a serious way, we've got to go for number one. And you certainly made a commitment to get into it in a serious way. On all fronts. Now, I think the, the foundation to this was Sony, longer than five years ago, acquired Minolta. And that kind of started as the foundation for you know, where things have gone in the future. But five years ago, and one reason why we're using five-year time marks here, is the first A7 was announced, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And was that the A7 or just the plain A7? The A7 and the A7R. Uh -huh. The original. The original. At NAB, OG. Right? Uh, it was done. The R uh, was at NAB. Uh, the S, 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 S was, was at, at NAB. Um, NAB. The A7 and A7R was October 13th, 2017, if I remember correctly. It set the world on fire because, you know, it was all of a sudden there's this interesting full frame digital camera, which was kind of unheard of at the time, in a different kind of. Uh, um, form factor. I mean, literally, you know, all the cameras were very rounded and fairly big. And here, this thing was small, compact, you know, a little bit uh, designed differently. But it, it did some fascinating things uh, for the time. And as we progressed over the years, and you know, anything, you know, you, you, you had lenses. Um, and of course, there was an A mount E mount thing going on at the time. Uh, there was a, the A mount was inherited from the, the Minolta. Is that correct? Yep. So the, the A mount lenses were from the, the Minolta days, and then E mount started with the A7, and which meant you had to make a commitment to designing and uh, producing and introducing lenses on a mount that nobody had before. But correct me if I'm wrong. One of the the attractions to this was you could use an adapter and put other lenses on the camera. The real strength was the technology inside the lens matched the technology inside the camera for the current times. It wasn't legacy lens on current technology camera. And, and as we've learned, and not that we want to go into a lot of technical, but mirrorless lenses have a whole other lens design going with them in, in regards to how they actually operate which you know, is why right now you're ahead of the game and uh, the others might have to, to do some catch up because um, and we, this is a whole other technical side of things but there's step motors and uh, actually servo motors and different elements of the lenses that move and Sony's E-mount lenses have all been designed 
to work with and in conjunction with a live sensor at all times and you know making these things move much much faster than normally can be done through uh, the autofocus systems of uh, DSLR type cameras. Exactly. I think if we, if we think of the the adaptability of mirrorless cameras, it's one of the wonderful things about the, the technology with the the flange back is is you can put virtually any any lens onto these systems. But the, those old lenses are still those old lenses. There there's limitations to them. Uh, the the uh, resolution uh, that they can produce, the resolving power, the the speed that they can autofocus, the um, the motors, as you talked about, whether whether it works in the in the world where still and video continue to to become blurry and blurrier, you want you need that that quiet motor. So those things are really critical. And uh, so when when we get into really the power of what mirrorless can be, it becomes the not just the body because the the body is just one part of it, but as Mike talked about, is it's the power of the lenses and. From Sony's perspective, uh, we, we've been investing, and we knew that we would, that to make this system, we have to make this investment. Five years, 28 lenses later, um, introducing technology that we put into G Master and, and all of the lenses, we can now do so many things that could never be possible in, pri prior to to the mirrorless world. And I, I think it, to, to take it a step further, the the beauty of the mirrorless system is the fact that. It works off the sensor. Everything comes off the sensor. You've got more autofocus points, a capability of doing phase and contrast detection. Uh, the information comes right from the chips, so it's all going through and processing, which means obviously the, the sensor's on all the time, but you're seeing the effects of things and the ability to do fast autofocus. And I have to say, you know, if you haven't experienced and picked up a Sony and tried the IAF, this is simply freaking phenomenal where, you know, you can be tracking a subject, push the button, it locks onto the eye, and no matter what, it never loses it. Um, you know, these kind of things are what innovation's all about. Mm. I wrote a Ranatorial two years ago, and, and I said if I was a betting man, and I was kind of looking at the industry and trying to decide, you know, where I, if I was a betting man, where I would put my money. And the bottom line was I put my money both with Fuji and Sony, but particularly Sony because the track record was kind of showing that, you know, specifically after a weekend of the Kentucky Derby, you know, the odds were with you. And it wasn't a long shot at all. <laughs> and you certainly have proven that. Um, when I look at the cameras you've introduced now, the A9 particularly, you have a different sensor in there, 20 plus frames a second, no blackout. Uh, give me a little bit of idea on the development of that. That had to be major. Exactly, and it's just a it's just a year old that from from around now is is we introduced this ca this camera and we talked about it as as the true digital age and and what we're signifying is that just in the same transition that we went from film to digital that was really one phase we're now moving to this this post DSLR world which is the true digital age and and just as you talked about the advancements that's happening in the sensor technology is enabling people to do so many amazing things that never were possible so an A9 that marries up 20 frames per second, uh, 60 times a second it's, it's um, autofocusing, and marrying that completely silent operation, what you can do is now you can, you can um, capture images that were never captured before. If you think about the, the images that are now starting to be captured from the Oval Office and being placed into, into these locations on the where, golf on the oh, golf right. course, it's so it's many places. completely silent. It, it's just an amazing, amazing piece, and I think that that technology gives you some insight of where the industry is going. And just as you talked about, is in the old days the DSLR, the mirror was hiding the the sensor 99% of the time. It was only till that last bit where it actually was was u being utilized. Now, by by freeing up the sensor, being able to utilize it, you can have all these amazing things with 93% coverage and being able to capture the 4K video with still images and and bringing those pieces together. So it's just a wonderful, wonderful world from, from the photographer and the enthusiast from the professional side. I have to say, um, I've taken the A9 to both Antarctica and, uh, and the Arctic, and uh, last summer I hit the 100-400 G Master. I'm sitting in a Zodiac, and I'm watching these Arctic fox up on this hill, and this Arctic fox grabs a bird from the nest and runs off with it, and his two brothers come running down. So I'm shooting, and I have a 100 to 400. 10 feet from the, the shore, you know, floating because there was a polar bear there and we, we shouldn't get on shore when there's a polar bear there. And I just start shooting at 20 frames a second. And for me, the silent shutter is really disorienting. So I have to turn that little like, um, 
you know, fake sound on just so I can get the, <laughs> the sounds for it. And I'm like following this thing. And then I'm just going, oh, God, no, 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 please don't run out. Don't run out. Don't let the buffer run out. And I've got the most magnificent set of shots. Not only is every one of them dead nuts focused on, but I never pushed the buffer. And I probably shot close to 50 or so images in that, in that whole sequence as that thing took place. And after that, I was just amazed. And now the 100 to 400 is my favorite lens. Well, you see, this is why we do it. It's, this is why it, we do it. This is condo. So, so if you, if <laughs> this you, is condo. If you go back those five years or maybe a couple before that, the, you know, we had a pretty significant digital still camera business. So we had to make the hard, tough decision to cannibalize that business and go after this business because image sensors are in yeah, sure. phones, right? And we, we have a commanding share of that world, worldwide business. And when we made that decision, people uh, thought a Shizuka team may have been a little nuts at the time to be making an investment of such size into an industry that was so mature. But what he was looking at was the future of going upstream, right? So some may call it disruptive, but let's just call it upstream. Exactly what you just spoke to, which we are listening and solving the pain points of the enthusiast, the hobbyist, the professional, yeah, right? We have great image sensors that can capture daily casual photos, yep. and we have great cameras that can do that as well. But when we hear from someone like yourself, the storytelling you just went through, that's what makes a difference. That's what motivates our engineers to solve the pain points. I do have to make a video on my own called the Sony Fanboy because, you know, people are going to say, well, you only talk about Sony. Well, you know, as I've said, it's kind of hard not to talk about Sony when Sony's Sony put nine cameras listen. out in one year, you yeah. know. So, you know, the, the other guys just aren't doing it. And we, we say that. And uh, we have a new series called On the Rocks. In our first episode, we talk about the camera industry. And, you know, the industry focused on, you know, how Sony's just, you know, got the ball and they're running. And, you know, there's nobody in the field anywhere close to tackling them. Um, yes, Nikon and the Canon are all saying they're going to come out with mirrorless. But, um, you know, I'm sure by the time they come out with something, you've already got other things in mind. I mean, which, you know, even comes to, like, the G Master lenses. Now, you know, being a photographer for so many years and kind of a smart press person, you don't make a a lens that can resolve to nearly 100 megapixels just so it can work on a 40 megapixel camera someday. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of fun things that you most likely have gotten to go. And, you know, as we go towards the future, I think one of the, the things that, you know, you've shown already is uh, the, the backside illuminated sensor. And, you know, the fact that you guys also have a, a, so, a sensor division says that, you know, there's going to be some exciting technology changes there, right? Definitely, and if you look at, at what how far the technology has come in just the past several years and think about that connection point and the fact that so many more devices are now utilizing these sensors, so uh, it's not just the, the, the camera the cameras that we're developing it for, but it's everything, that all this great technology. So the idea of, of resolving greater um, resolution or the ability to see darker um, picture, you know, make daylight, day, uh, turn nighttime into daylight, all of those things um, gives us the opportunity more and more in the next couple of years is gonna be crazy exciting. I think to be, to be truthful, the biggest challenge we have right now is, is uh, demand and making the sensors that we, <laughs> Getting, getting more out of the factory. Well, well if you yeah. think about it, low light sensitivity and think about autonomous driving, you know, your eyes can adjust to the change in light going into a tunnel, a dark tunnel, oncoming vehicles, you know, sensing something coming from the left or from the right, you know, early enough to do something about it. And image sensors could do that, right? So there's, there's great future, future opportunity. One of the things I enjoy about uh, the sensors in the, the A7 line as well as the A9 is the dynamic range. And, you know, never did I think we would be able to have a 15-stop dynamic range capability. Now, as a landscape photographer, and I used to do a lot of fashion and portrait work, but where I'm doing things now, and I'm luminous landscape, I actually got that in my title. I kind of focus on <laughs> landscapes. But, you know, I take my A7R3 out, and, you know, I work a shot, kind of make sure I got the histogram and take the picture. Uh, my images then go into Capture One, and what the beauty is, is to me, first off, a photograph has got to go to print when it's finished. Secondly, when it's in print, you want to see the, the minute details. So 
by able to open up shadow areas just enough and explore into areas that you weren't able to explore before, I can put a big print up on the wall and if somebody walks up to it and they look at it and they go, hmm, and they walk up closer and closer and they immerse themselves in the image because not only do we have the details and the highlights, but you know, now we're showing really minute details that we can't even see in the viewfinder on the print. And I mean, this has become, you've enabled photographers now with this technology to take photography further. And you know, this Can Do, Can -Do event is a perfect example of how, you know, we've learned so much here just from our press briefings this morning and other things uh, of where you're going. So where do you see five years from now where Sony's going to be? We just celebrated 72 years and our most successful and profitable year in those 72. So. You know, I think there is um, a lot of opportunity on the horizon if you think about passions. So we happen to own studios and music company and a gaming company, obviously an electronics company. But if you think about the collective Sony and you think about the definition of condo, it's really touching people emotionally. And what touches people emotionally? Passions, right? Yep. Photography is, I think, the best demonstration of what we call condo, which is that emotional attachment. And you know, we we're talking to somebody earlier that said, you don't even have to say anything. Just like you just said, when you shoot, when you put the print up, people get immersed in it, right? It's a feeling that is personal to them and something that they cherish and interpret in their own way. Frankly, I don't see that going away. I see that, you know, in increasing and passions becoming more and more important as we get busier and you know, carry on longer hours in the workforce and so on and so forth. How do you get lost in your passions and your soul and your spirit? And photography is a great way to do it. So I, th I think five years from now, you know, we will continue to be innovative in technology and form factors and tool sets and way to do things differently and uniquely, but the passions will remain the same. I don't know, Neil, what do you uh, think? I think, um, you always throw out the stats on how much, how many more photos are being taken. And, that, and, that, and that's a great point. Is it's becoming the the if you think about not that long ago, how how difficult it was to publish a picture, right. yeah. and and think about how easy it is, how transparent it is. Just even sitting here right now, we're talking about this is going up on Instagram. This is going to go here. <laughs> this it, that's that's today. We're not talking five years in the huh. future. And, but, but now if we can imagine what's going to happen from, from the publishing perspective and enabling the, the, the technology that traditionally was held only to the, you know, the, the, the studios, the professional studios and, and creating content from that perspective. But now it becomes into the hands of everyone. And then from the publishing perspective, you can now publish it as, as easily and seamlessly. Now what, what's going to happen is that, that exponential growth continues in, the, in that trajectory. So now more cameras, more sensors, more ways to capture, more lifelike, more immersive, more sharing, more of that is, is going to, I mean, it's going to be, uh, uh, we're not going to be able to identify that in, in yeah. any kind of connection. We're going to look at today in such an archaic world and how did we possibly survive <laughs> through, through this world. Well, we've got seven plus decades of core technology, yep. intellectual property. If we do what we've done really well the last five years and listen to the customer, listen to the user, listen to the professional, so the consumer, we have the greatest engineers, I believe, on the planet. <laughs> Obviously, we're blessed with some great marketers, yep. right? So if we continue to listen, we have the core technologies to disrupt the future or make that change. And the other thing I'd like to, th to think about, and I think this is gonna be much more important right now, is the ability to connect to our devices more quicker. You talked about the ability to get images out right away. Um, I know there's you know ways to connect, but it's not the, the easiest way to connect. You know, it should be, you know, push one button, the images come over, pick the one I want, and, and send it up to the, uh, the Instagrams and the, the social media accounts. I think, you know, connectivity of, you know, being able to sit down here and hold over my iPad and be able to say, this is what I shot this morning without having to go download and try to move things around. I think that's the other area that needs to be improved. And while we're at it, the two things I predict, <laughs> one of the things, I, I see 16-bit, you know, coming in. I mean, we're at 14-bit, and I, you know, we, you can't really take 24 megapixel sensors and, you know, keep adding to the numbers, but I, I still think there's a big step 
just being able to get to the 16-bit point, correct? So I'm sure you're looking at, you know, things lo along those lines, which, you know, I just have, you know, a good feeling where, like I said, if I'm going to put my money somewhere, I think I put it someplace good. And I can't wait to see what you guys come out with next. So the good news is you're at the exact right place because we have the <laughs> engineers from Japan. You have the people here that are listening and, and, and we have so many focus groups and, and so much interaction and community building in terms of, of getting yep. your feedback. is it's, it's a good place to be. Well, the fact that you listen like that, and I know you're, you've listened to some of that before, uh, I think it's just really exciting. And I know we're really busy. I've, I've taken a bit of your time out to sit down and I do appreciate it very, very much. Um, you know, the fact that you can communicate this out not only to our audience, but the wider audience that, uh, you know, get a chance to see it. Um, you know, I always look forward to the email uh, from Matt. <laughs> it's like, what are you guys up to next? And of course, we all predict, all the, all the press guys get together and we kind of like, you know, interview each other, go, oh, what do you think it's going to be? And like, you surprise us with the A7 III. And frankly, in closing, I think that was a stroke of genius. You know, the A7 III, the new 24 megapixel, less than $2,000, feature packed like you can't believe. And the images coming off of that and with like the 24 to 105 lens, just just in a magnificent package. I bet you can't even make them fast enough, but uh, beautiful, beautiful camera. We call it our basic, which is anything but basic. Your basic. <laughs> Very, very clever on your part. Neil, okay. as always, pleasure. Thank you. Can't wait to see you more. Michael, thanks so much. Thanks for and, all you uh, do. all your readers, I hope you got something out of it and watch. Don't forget to click on the subscribe button below. And if you hit the bell, you might even get notified that we have other videos coming up. And for everybody else, I'll see you on the Luminous Landscape.